Hi, this is Chao Wei Huang from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and Frederick Health Hospital. Today we're going to discuss a case of a large coronary perforation in which a pericardiogram, uh, which is seldom done, uh, was helpful. We're going to review how to manage uh, coronary perforations, including the use of covered stents and how to uh, deploy uh, coronary coils. The uh, patient is a 60-year-old woman uh, who had stenting of her RCA for a non-STEMI about uh, six months ago. At that time, she had a lesion in the OM, which was left for medical therapy. She uh, returned to the hospital with a recurrent chest pain and rolled in for another NSTEMI, uh, with troponin rising to 1.2. Her echo showed normal EF uh, with no uh, regional wall motion abnormalities, and on cath, um, the stent uh, in the RCA was widely patent, and the LED has only mild disease. Uh, the circumflex and the OM uh, are shown. So uh, what we see is a severe stenosis in the proximal OM, and it's now clear uh, why it was left alone uh, six months ago. Uh, the proximal circumflex and OM were quite torturous, uh, and there are, are uh, double switchbacks. And wiring and stenting this lesion uh, is uh, certainly not going to be a uh, walk in the park. So uh, as uh, advertised, uh, wiring was a little tricky. An uh, AL1 guide uh, was used for backup. Um, a, a BMW uh, could not get into the OM. A, a Pilot 50 uh, finally uh, eventually made it through uh, using a fine cross microcatheter. Uh, it was then exchanged uh, to a wiggle wire uh, for a better support. Um, there was a lot of wire bias, as you can see in the OM, but fortunately, a patient didn't really have any uh, chest discomfort. Uh, it was then difficult to pass equipment, and a guide liner was necessary, even with the backup uh, from the AL1 and the support uh, from the uh, wiggle wire. Uh, but the, eventually, uh, with a little effort, uh, the uh, lesion was uh, pre-dilated with a 225 balloon, uh, stented with a 225 by 15 millimeter DES, and uh, post-dilated uh, with a uh, 2.5 millimeter NC balloon. And uh, here is the uh, result after stenting. Uh, the uh, stented segment uh, looked good, uh, but uh, there was still a sig uh, significant amount of wire bias in both the uh, OM uh, and the uh, proximal circ. So a, a couple of tips uh, to reduce wire bias. Um, the, the easiest and most common way of doing this is just to pull the wire back and uh, perhaps uh, keeping only the floppy distal part of the wire in the vessel. Uh, but if you don't want to lose wire access uh, to the distal part of the vessel, another way is to exchange the wire uh, with a software uh, such as a SUO03. Or um, if you don't have a SUO03 in the lab, uh, you can also exchange the wire with a soft, flexible microcatheter uh, such as a fine cross uh, or a caravel and just take the wire out and uh, leave the microcatheter behind. Uh, these microcatheters are usually floppy enough uh, that they won't uh, significantly uh, straighten the vessel. So uh, with the wiggle wire pulled back, uh, the OM uh, looks pretty good. But hmm, uh, what is that stuff distally? Uh, is that uh, venous return? Oh my god. Uh, definitely uh, not the venous return. Um, there is a massive uh, distal perforation uh, with blood uh, pouring into the pericardial space. Uh, the wiggle wire tip uh, probably punctured the vessel uh, with the wiggles then um, shearing the blood vessel open as the wire was being pulled back. So uh, after quite a few uh, scatological references and colorful four letter expressions of indignation, a 40 by 20 millimeter balloon was maneuvered into the proximal circumflex and inflated uh, to seal off the OM. Uh, getting that large balloon into the circ was actually not a simple affair uh, with the tortuosity of the vessel. Uh, inflation pressure was kept low um, at eight atmospheres uh, to avoid uh, damaging uh, the circumflex. The uh, balloon was kept inflated uh, for more than 15 minutes. And importantly, uh, anticoagulation was not reversed. Uh, with all this equipment in the coronary, uh, the last thing you want to do is to thrombose the left main and cause even more problems. But unfortunately, the patient was crashing. Uh, she had crushing chest pain. Uh, she became very agitated, profoundly hypotensive. Uh, fluids were wide open. Uh, blood was caught and on the way. 
uh, norepinephrine was uh, rapidly titrated up with uh, dopamine infusion uh, quickly added. Uh, she also received a couple of pushes of epinephrine uh, while depressors uh, were being hung. Uh, she was clearly in tamponade. Uh, statica was requested and uh, was on the way. Cardiac surgery was notified. Um, emergency uh, pericardiocentesis was then performed uh, from the subxiphoid approach with the, with the patient uh, buckling around uh, the table in extremis. Uh, blood return uh, was obtained from the uh, pericardiocentesis catheter, but it wasn't clear if the catheter was in the pericardial space, and there certainly was no time to wait for an echo. So a, a pericardiogram was performed, uh, which you see here, uh, using five cc's of contrast. Uh, this is not frequently done, but it is easy to do and is quite helpful in a pinch. Uh, and the pericardiogram did confirm a catheter placement um, in the pericardial space. So eventually, uh, 500 cc's of frank blood uh, was uh, evacuated. Her uh, pressure uh, improved uh, with uh, pericardiocentesis, uh, but with the codominant uh, circumflex occluded, uh, the patient started having uh, runs of uh, polymorphic VT. Uh, she had a, multiple runs, uh, received at least six shocks, an amiodarone bolus, as well as a lidocaine bolus. Uh, she was intubated, uh, blood uh, arrived. Uh, she uh, received three units of uh, PAC red cells uh, using the uh, rapid uh, transfuser. And in some cases, uh, was not done here, but auto uh, transfusion uh, by uh, uh, connecting the uh, pericardial drain directly to a venous sheath uh, could also be uh, considered. So uh, despite occluding the OM for uh, two 15-minute intervals, uh, there was persistent uh, extravasation uh, in the distal OM. Uh, this is perhaps not surprising uh, given the size of the perforation. Uh, so what are our options? Well, uh, we could place a covered stent in the circumflex uh, to exclude the OM, uh, but uh, given the t uh, difficulty of passing even a balloon into the torturous circ, uh, passing a covered stent uh, was uh, not going to be easy. Uh, the other option is to embolize the OM, uh, either using the patient's own fat or thrombus or uh, using uh, endovascular coils. And uh, this uh, seemed uh, to be the option uh, to try first. So uh, the OM was uh, rewired uh, with the whisper wire. Uh, the angulation of the OM and the fresh stent uh, made the uh, rewiring actually uh, quite a challenge. Uh, after the OM was rewired, a, a renegade catheter uh, was passed into the OM over the whisper wire. Uh, this catheter is an 018 catheter uh, that will be used uh, to deliver the coils. A catheter injection uh, was performed uh, to, conf uh, to confirm that it was indeed in the OM uh, in the appropriate uh, position. Uh, next, uh, via the Renegade, uh, three uh, Vortex 18 coils uh, were delivered to the OM. Uh, we'll go over exactly how this is uh, done in a little bit. Uh, but notice that there is actually still flow around the coils. Uh, that's actually normal. Uh, thrombosis is usually not immediate and can take a few minutes. Uh, you can inflate a balloon uh, proximal to the coils uh, to help accelerate uh, the uh, clotting process. So uh, finally, after a couple of minutes, uh, the OM thrombosed and the uh, perforation uh, was uh, successfully sealed off. Uh, next, the uh, proximal circumflex was stented with a 3.5 by 23 millimeter DES and the post dilated with a 4.0 millimeter NC balloon. Uh, this was done uh, just in case uh, there were any uh, micro dissections uh, that resulted from the uh, repeated uh, prolonged uh, balloon inflations. And uh, here is the uh, final andrographic result. Uh, the OM is occluded, uh, the perforation is closed, and uh, there was TIMI-3 flow uh, in the circumflex. Uh, the patient came off of pressors uh, completely uh, by the end of the case and was admitted uh, to the ICU. The uh, pericardial drain was left overnight and an additional 100 cc's of uh, bloody fluid uh, was uh, evacuated. Um, echo on the uh, following day uh, showed no residual, no residual effusion. Uh, EF uh, uh, was a preserve, although there was uh, some lateral hypokinesis. Uh, she was uh, successfully extubated and went home on day three on DAPT, uh, as well as a course of uh, colchicine uh, to uh, reduce the possibility of uh, developing uh, pericarditis. 
Okay, so uh, perforations are uh, never pleasant, and as we saw in this case, uh, patients uh, can crash quickly. So uh, when you're faced with a coronary perforation, uh, first, and as quickly as possible, uh, temporize the bleed. Uh, inflate the balloon, uh, match one-to-one -one, uh, with the vessel diameter at low pressure uh, to occlude the vessel. Uh, you'll need to keep the balloon inflated for a long period of time, uh, usually 15 minutes or even longer. Uh, second, um, anticoagulation should not be reversed uh, unless all equipment is out of the coronary artery. Uh, you run the risk of thrombosing the larger, more proximal vessels and uh, causing even bigger problems. Uh, third, uh, if the patient becomes hypotensive, uh, you'll need fluids, pressors, and sometimes even uh, mechanical uh, circulatory support. Uh, you may need to perform uh, emergency pericardiocentesis to uh, relieve the tamponade. Uh, you may need to transfuse or even auto-transfuse uh, for very large uh, perforations. Uh, obviously, uh, remember to get help, uh, alert uh, cardiac surgery, uh, ask another in interventionalist uh, to come assist you. Uh, prolonged balloon inflation will more often than not be uh, sufficient uh, to uh, close the perforation. And if that's the case, great. Um, do consider stenting the vessel uh, given possible microdissections uh, from the balloon inflation. But uh, what if the perforation does not seal uh, with uh, prolonged balloon inflations? Well, if the uh, perforation is in a large vessel, uh, then your principal option is to use covered stents, either the graft master or the uh, PK papyrus. So the graft master is the most commonly available covered stent in the United States. It's suitable for vessels larger than 275 millimeters in diameter. But because it's a stent sandwich, it is not particularly deliverable. And for the larger diameters, it still requires a seven French guide. The PK papyrus is a newer covered stent. It consists of a layer of, of electrospun nanofiber on a single stent. So it's a lot more deliverable than a graft master and a six French guide will be sufficient to accommodate all sizes. All right, so what if the perforation is in a small vessel like a side branch? Well, one option is to actually use a covered stent as well, but in the main branch that then excludes the side branch. The other option is to embolize the vessel, uh, either using the patient's own uh, fat or, or clot, or to use endovascular coils. Coils come in many different flavors, uh, but uh, pushable coils uh, tend to be available in most cath labs, and in many ways are the easiest to use in an emergency. Uh, there are different types of pushable coils. Um, here are two examples. Uh, Spring-like coils, such as a vortex, um, can fill the lumen of uh, larger vessels. And street coils uh, are used for smaller, tiny vessels. Uh, coils uh, generally come already uh, loaded in an introducer, uh, which is this uh, yellow device uh, that is shown here. So uh, briefly, uh, to deploy the coils, uh, you uh, uh, first put the uh, tip of the introducer uh, into the, the microcatheter that you have already in place. A second, uh, a pusher is provided uh, that is used to push the coil from the introducer into the microcatheter. And third, uh, a corner wire is then used to push the coil through the microcatheter into the target vessel. All right, so uh, let's go over how to deliver uh, pushable coils uh, in a little bit more detail. So first, uh, you advance a, a microcatheter uh, into the perforated vessel uh, in the usual manner. Uh, you uh, position the end of the microcatheter uh, where you want to deploy the coil, uh, which is obviously going to be upstream uh, from the perforation. Uh, next, uh, you load your pushable coil into the microcatheter uh, by inserting the introducer that contains the coil uh, into the mouth of the microcatheter, and then using the pusher uh, to push the coil from the introducer into the microcatheter. Uh, after the coil is pushed into the microcatheter, uh, you then use a workhorse wire uh, to push the coil along the microcatheter into the perforated vessel. A uh, BMW wire works uh, quite well, and you would advance it uh, into the microcatheter with the floppy end first, uh, just like you normally would use a BMW. Now, a, a couple of tips. Uh, many coils are not compatible with 014 microcatheters, so we uh, do keep some 018 microcatheters around the lab uh, for this reason. And second, the pushable coils are not easily retrievable uh, once they're uh, delivered. Uh, so make sure that the end of your microcatheter is positioned exactly uh, where you want the coil to be deployed. 
Okay, so if your perforation is in a uh, small distal part of a major vessel, a uh, covered stent that will not be an option. Here again, you can use coils or fat or clot uh, to embolize the vessel. And delivering fat or coil or, or clot is actually uh, very similar to delivering coils. Uh, first, you uh, place your microcatheter in a target vessel. Um, you trim off a little piece of the patient's own fat or clot and then introduce it into the microcatheter. And next, uh, rather than using a wire to push the fat or clot along, uh, you generally flush it down the microcatheter uh, with a saline flush. And at this point, uh, if your perforation is still not closed, uh, then uh, you'll have to call cardiac surgery. Uh, while you're waiting for them, uh, keep the occluding balloon inflated and uh, transfuse and or provide hemodynamic support uh, as uh, needed. All right, uh, take home messages. Uh, first, I love the wiggle wire. It's a great wire. Uh, it does provide excellent support, but as this case uh, dramatically shows, uh, keep careful track of uh, the distal tip. Uh, it can cause major problems. Now, uh, when you're faced uh, with a coronary perforation, uh, first uh, keep calm, uh, inflate a balloon uh, to occlude the vessel uh, to temporize the situation. If needed, uh, support the blood pressure, uh, perform pericardiocentesis if there is tamponade, and in a pinch, if echo is not available, a pericardiogram uh, can help confirm the position of your catheter in the pericardial space. Next, if the perforation doesn't seal uh, with uh, prolonged balloon inflation, uh, reach for a covered stent uh, for larger vessels or coils, fat, or thrombus uh, for smaller vessels. Remember not to stop anticoagulation unless all your, of your equipment is out of the coronary. And call for help, uh, alert cardiac surgery, and ask a colleague in the cath lab to come help. Thank you for watching.